read the law of his Tasmanians, acknowledgement of Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples. We acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of this land. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and future, who hold the memories, traditions, culture and hope of Tasmanians first peoples. Law of Tasmania also pays respect to the resilience and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and extends that respect to, to all First Australian peoples. We've just had a couple more new people come in, so I think it must be two o'clock um, now, so I want to introduce Dr Elizabeth Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I should say, for those who don't know me, that for nine and a half years I worked as the genealogical researcher at the public trustee. I'm mostly finding next to kin for people who didn't have wills. And I think, in fact, if you've got last year's talk still, that talk on forensic genealogy is still available. But today, what I want to talk about are three case histories where there's a big gap between the present generation and the story in the past which their family felt that they knew or believed. So I've got three um, people or families that I've talked about people work on. One's Tasmanian, one's an interstate family and one is what uses overseas records mostly. And the purpose is for this talk is to show what resources can be used and to give you some idea of the process, which is not always straightforward. And it's possible that my brain is not always straightforward. <laughs> In each case, it was possible to join the dots using records available online. At least one case was done when it was, it was largely during the lockdown, when there really was nothing else you could go and look at. Um, and although in some cases hard copy records would have helped, um, eventually they eventually did confirm information, all the information that solved these cases were done using, was done using online information. So the first case study is the Tasmanian one. Um, many of you will know of Daniel Herbert, who was a stonemason who did the um, carvings on Ross Bridge. And the informant, who was a friend of a friend, believed that he was descended from him. End of information. Apart from his name and his father's name and his grandfather's name. So, luckily, Daniel Herbert is well known. And there is an Australian Dictionary of Biography article. We're very fortunate that that is available freely online. And it's really very useful. It's there. It's got academic credibility, all their articles, and often they have, they always have the evident resources that they've used, so it's always worth checking that. Hamish Maxwell Stewart, one of our local um, historians, has written that article, and in that he had the name of Daniel Herbert's wife, Mary Witherington, the place and date of the marriage, which is Ross in 1835, which of course is before registration started, so doesn't turn up on the names index. And Hamish just helpfully says they had three children. So I then thought, what's the next thing? The names index um, does not give uh, more than only gives one child, and it's Ernest, who was born and died in the 1840s, so clearly my informant was not descended from Ernest. In any way, anyway, he's heard. And the surname we were looking for was Tucker. So then I looked for a, um, a, a Herbert Tucker marriage. And this was, as I said, during the lockdown, so it wasn't possible to look at the Pioneer Index or the Federation Index to see this helpful list of children. Um, and it also wasn't possible to look at Ross baptisms, the registers which are available, but they're in hard copy, uh, or possibly a microfilm. And, also, the other thing that would have been really useful is that there's a correspondence file on Daniel Herbert in the history room. Does everybody know about the correspondence files? Okay, do not neglect them. There are four or five filing cabinets in the room behind the history room and they consist of 
It's totally random whether somebody will be in there or a topic will be in there. It's always worth asking if, there, if there's a correspondence file on your topic or your person. They are a lot of the very old answers from um, archives offices in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but as well as that, for some topics, people have added information. In this case, people have done that for Daniel Herbert, as I eventually found when we were able to get in there. And that you'll often find this, for instance, this really good correspondence file in, um, that people have maintained and put more information on military people. That's just one example. Always worth asking this for a correspondence file. And I sometimes forget and keep myself that I should have looked first. So I searched for a marriage for a Herbert to a Tucker. And great, there we go. We've got Sarah Ann Sophia, who married Francis John Tucker in 1963, and there's Daniel Herbert as a witness. So I was pretty sure I was onto the right uh, line, <coughs> but that still left a gap. So there is my informant's father and grandfather at the bottom, and they're the dots that I wanted to connect up to Sarah Ann Sophia Herbert and her father. And so if you think about what we're going to do in between that, now the names in the next little okay, let's look for children for Sarah and Francis. And um, they, sorry, I feel like this is not terribly good, but they, they actually had 10 children, at which my heart sank slightly. Um, but then I discovered, to my happiness, and probably not theirs, that not all of them survived to adult. <laughs> It's a bit awkward when you believe Oh, good luck. You realise that the Greek and Paris essentially are very good. But out of them, and, but they only had three sons who survived to adulthood and had to have children. So that did make life slightly easier and narrowed it down. So then I started looking at them. Again, remember this is in the absence of the Federation Index, so I couldn't really check their children birth up to 19. Um, 19 very easily. But what I did do was um, slide sideways to Williams. And I found that Thomas, who died in 1951, had first of administration um, for the public trustees, so there's no detail in his wills. Because wills, if you do get a will, quite often they actually say they're leaving things to people they're leaving things to, with a bit of luck. So Alfred Sorrell, who, whose actual marriage certificate was, is online in the archives, and so some of those early 1900s marriage certificates are starting to come, become digitised. And he died in 1954, and he's all named three sons as executors. And at one point, I followed them a little bit with not much um, joy. But then I looked for William George and found through the I think it was the, the Carville Cemetery Records in Launceston that he died in 1975, and I swiftly looked at his will and hit a pay dirt. He named William Brian Tucker, my informant's father, as his grandson. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it's actually his writing, in the right time he's writing, his grandson was added because his parents had separated divorced and I, I think his grandfather was um, taking a bit of extra care of that particular grandson. It's my supposition because we found all the information about the divorce and so on in this case in Trove. And so that was, it sounds relatively easy, but there was quite a bit of swapping between what first is in marriage records and the newspapers and wills. Okay, so there we have that line. Daniel Herbert to his daughter, to William George, who lived to about 95, which as far as surprised was another generation somewhere in the middle there, and then to Bob and to William, and then to my informant. And also, I want to look at the resources used just to give you some ideas. So, I mentioned already the Australian Dictionary Biography, the Convict Records, which were very less to have in such um, profusion and digitised. Much better than the previous New South Wales, our conflict records are far more complete. The names index, <coughs> newspapers in Trove, 
digitise wills that we're very fortunate that sorry we're very fortunate with that because Victoria the wills are digitised only after about 1954. The New South Wales wills I think you can get them either through Find My Past or um, the Women's Site Family Search, but they're only up to the 1950s. So really, we are very fortunate in that. Digitalised wills up to 1989, not the 1924. Symmetry records. May I make a plug for symmetry records? They are being digitised, well, the indexes are being put online. Oh, I don't the difference is exponential to when I started uh, working about like just 18 years ago. I suspect that local councils and so on are finding that it's more economical to buy the bullet, get them online, and to see the updating them than to have staff having to answer the phone all the time. Sure. I, 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 that's just my educated guess because so many, it's always worth checking a local cemetery. And lots of things like bigger and grays and those kind of stuff, just not, you know, they have three people that somebody's added to it. They don't have the whole thing. Look for the local, the nearest cemetery to where you think the person might die from the minute. Search around, you can usually not even find lists of the local cemeteries. Brisbane, Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne have got grouped amounts of cemeteries. Um, if you can, oh, I won't go into all the details, but the, yeah, definitely findable. And um, the other thing is in Victoria, if you're interested in Victoria, and make for us, this is the one I found, but I'm not available. There's a wonderful website called Carol's Headstone Photographs, and this woman has come on in Victoria photographing headstones. And she, they're all, that's an index of that. You can email her and say, please come out of the photograph of John Smith's died and said to us. It's so, and she said, I'll have a page, she says, no. So, and that's just, so it's Carol's history, my photographs, that's Victoria, regional and, and country ones. It's not absolutely every, almost every small cemetery in Victoria. The Verizon Index of Death Notices, if you don't already really know that, it's a really useful beginning often. Of course, the electoral roll and ancestry, I, I think I use this because we expanded to search for the rest of the family. And, and it was also while we were trying to find which of those three sons might have had children. The Argos Cross and Mother's Files also a, um, a book on Ross Ridge and Daniel Herbert's sculpture by Leslie Green and Norm Laird. And I believe somebody else is doing research currently on Daniel Herbert, so I may be new one coming out. Okay, so our next one is an interstate one. Um, this was, this came about because of my daughter in law's um, parents, a friend of mine, was staying with me at our holiday house in Fort Lauderdale for a few days in Victoria before the lockdown and everything happened. And we were just talking about family history and my daughter in law's father, and there's a word for that relationship in Spanish, but I don't know the language. And he said, Oh, it's interesting, he said, uh, I believe that I've got an ancestor, well, I've been told, I don't know if it's true, that somebody called Isaac Nichols is some sort of ancestor, and he was the first person after Sydney, and I'm not sure if he was a convict originally, or Marine or something, and but we think he was convicted in the colony and sent to Norfolk Island, and we think he was involved in the runway. Sound too fascinating to ignore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read my iPad and I think they had their laptop. We started to look for this. I said, well, I reckon we'd probably find something on this one. And we sure did. So, you can see somebody's the first somebody in Australia. Somebody's probably written about them. So it's worth a check. And sure enough, these are the things that turned out to be correct. He was the first postmaster. Macquarie knew not him. He was originally a convict, which they haven't been sure about. He's not something in the line of It's not first fled, it's third or whatever. He was convicted in the colony, and that is really interesting to the whole story itself. And it looks like he was framed by people in the Rump Corps. 
but and he was sentenced to be transported to Rock Island, but the government hunter was so um, convinced that this was all a total beat up that they referred the case to London, took two years for the verdict to come up back, and he was acquitted and not sent to Rock Island. <coughs> yes, later he was involved in the drum group. So all of that is true, it's all fascinating to read about, and of course. Uh, my friend was really interested in going, wow, I had no idea about that. that. He well, got to prove that there were related verse, but had no idea what that was. And, and so we had a gap between my signals and Edith and then Badcock, who was my friend's grandmother. And it was on that side that he believed the connection was. Now, the ADB showed that my signals was married with Santa Abraham's or Julia. And that he had, they had three sons, Isaac David, George Robert, and Charles Hamilton. So of course we didn't know how they connected. So then we went on backwards from Edith. And she had a father who gave them the rules to back off. That's why it's not like a crime for insulin and isn't it? Wow, yeah, Nichols. Why is that? Nichols' name in there is hopefully suspicious. So that's great. And then we got Edward Nichols Badcock's parents. We had Badcock and Georgia Nichols. Excellent. I love it. Remember when one of the sons was called George? Just a possibility. You can't, you can't be sure, but just a possibility. So New South Wales first had many death, deaths, and marriages. It would be really good. Except that, as Edward was born in 1862, Georgia was clearly born before their registration started. I think that's about 1855. So, unless she's a seven-year-old mother, we were really earlier than that. So, then what did you do? So, up to then, it looks like it could have been just a straightforward family line going back from what we know, but we needed to connect. So, now I thought, oh, will be a marriage. No, no marriage in New South Wales. And it was no birth to Georgiana. So then I, this is where I ended up going backwards and forwards. I thought, okay, <coughs> let's go to Edmund's um, death and see what, if he gives us any more information. And it did at least give a second initial for both parents. So we were getting a little tiny, tiny bit closer. And in fact, I realised yesterday when I was going over this, that if I spread the search in trove for death notices to do with Edwin a little wider than just 1889 when he died. There's a death notice saying his wife and living one half wife and infant daughter to mourn his loss. That if I spread it a bit wider, we would have got something that would almost certainly have confirmed what we thought. Because it's all, I can, this is another hint, it's always worth checking the in the morning notices in the subsequent years. Because death crises in the last days tend to be really, really sparse. Sometimes they even say that the wife's name, in this case, one of them said the wife, the other one just said the morning wife and daughter. Sometimes they would just say the relic of, you know, a basin or something. But the in memoriam ones tend to be more detailed for some reason, five years later. So there was an in memoriam not so much for him as a little bit earlier for their twin sons, and one of those twin sons was George Robert Nichols Badcock, which I'm kind of happy because I'm going to have all the service today. And I went, okay, if I had thought that he had a son called George Robert Nichols Badcock, I would have thought I am not totally the right track. So, and then I thought, well, the next thing to do, let's see if George Nichols death, the same thing, can we get a bit more about her? Mm -hmm. what am I doing here? Okay. I can't get it to go down. That's okay. okay. Yep, we're right. So, George asked in 1921, she moved to the right old age too. Had a father, George R. Mark Robert. And Eliza, another name, Eliza, not just D. And then we hit Paybert to try to get the trove. She died. Um, in the country, and it was in the clear times, so we love local small newspapers. You have to fill their columns, and they know people are going to love looking at the local detail. 
This among our friends says that she died two days before her 89th birthday because she was born on the 10th of September 1832, which is very rarely for but I think it's the exact date for her birth. Her father, it says, was the uncle George Robert Nichols, can't you kiss him? That he was a Sydney solicitor and he was in the legislative council, all the things we knew already, there's no doubt about him as well, I'd say. And Mm -hmm. His father was the first postmaster, that's the third arrow down there, and down at the bottom it says when about 17 years of age, the deceased moved to New Zealand, went to New Zealand and it was there she was afterwards married to Lady Mr. William Noel Badcock. We'd love to know about a 17 year old girl goes across to New Zealand. And there's not too much later about it because she was born in September 1832. And she was married in New Zealand in 1849. Mm. So there's not a lot of later involved. She was, she was and her first child, child was born possibly in 1849 too. Um, that's all very interesting. I'd love to know why this is following and we'll try and provide that kind of aspect. Oh, and she does have actually a really interesting person just from what's written on here that says she was could talk. Very interesting about the early days in Sydney and that she had a splendid education, which is interesting. Her father had been sent back to England for his law studies, but she had been educated well and that she had extensive knowledge and she was really uh, interesting to talk with for the young generation. So, so all of that's really lovely for my friend to find out about the sun home. So there we have Isaac Nichols. Yeah, George Robert Nichols, Nichols is his first, first wife because he managed to have three wives and all of them had the name of Eliza. One was <laughs> Susanna Eliza. The first, first one was Eliza, and then Susanna and Eliza and Eliza, so he didn't have to worry about memory anymore. And, and but, but it did confirm that, that Georgiana was in the last, the first of the wives because she, the ADB said she died in 1935 and Georgiana was born in 1932. And so there's Georgiana and then Edward Nichols and Edith Nina. Now, this, uh, the uh, New Zealand marriage, as I said, is in the New Zealand birth, death, and marriage index. So even though it's before their registration started, New Zealand have included a lot of um, the early church registrations, so it's always worth checking in if it's, they're not all there, but it's worth checking, okay? The other thing is a hint to do with New Zealand births, that Although the Sonority searched over 100 years ago, like many of the indexes in other states in Australia, um, if the deceased date of birth was at least 80 years ago, you can search their deaths. And the deaths normally are only for 50 years ago, you want 50 years ago. But if they died quite recently, but they were 85, the death will be there on the index. And in fact, on the birth date will be given as well. So it's Again, always worth checking, not just to because it's, uh, it's not that long ago, but it's not worth checking in New Zealand. Now, a spin off for my friend and a day for my uh, family is that Isaac's wife, Rosanna, you know, Rosanna in the first slide about Isaac, Rosanna Abrahams or Julian, and that's the whole story itself. Rosanna was a baby on the first tweet with her mother who was a convict on the first tweet. And so my friend has two first tweet ancestors so and had no idea about my three, Rosanna's baby, could be a convict obviously, and then one, one convict. Um, they, in fact, um, her, Rosanna's father was Jewish, so they don't exactly know who he was, but I think there's another source that says he was Jewish. So that's all fascinating. And for my my four youngest grandchildren, therefore have first sweet ancestors, we had no idea of that until very big So they're, they're only progressed. Six, four, two, and zero, they are not yet, <laughs> not yet um, conscious of the honour. So the resources I used there, or we used to was the ADB again, New South Wales births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, <coughs> In case you don't know, their deaths uh, search or from 30 years ago or backwards. And they, after every year, it comes to more than 90 years. 
marriage is to the first time. Um, the tribals in New South Wales have absolutely, as I said, a gold mine here. That, and we initially did use cemetery records and comic records because we've done this more now on the rest of the family. So that gives you absolutely quite a lot. We really struck with that all that, and it did show that 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 chain, that little story, had been passed down from the female line, and you know, people that clung to it. First house master, something to do with North Carl, maybe brother, plus little kids, and it all turned out to be basically true. Okay, so third story was involved in those sex records. So, so what, how it started was that a young friend of mine from church, I remember one day, he's done, he's done a lot of his own family history, he said, look, I've traced a lot of things back, and we've talked about some of this before. Then he said, I just want to know. Can you access British newspapers like you can try with trove? And I said, not really, not, not as easily. They are available through the library. He could have found his library card, but that didn't help. Um, <laughs> and I think the National, National Library has some too. They are certainly more freely available than they used to be. But it's not quite as easy as trove. And I said, what's the issue? And he said, well, my man is still alive in the 80s. We'd love to know more about her mother. All she knows is that her mother's parents were killed in a car crash when she was a baby. Early 1900s. She knows that she came from the birthday of the 18th of June, wasn't sure what year, and that she immigrated to Australia in the 1920s and met her future husband on the boat. And the interesting thing was there that he was destined to go to, he was meant to go, he did go to Perth, and she was going to Adelaide to where she had some sort of commitment to a job. But they stayed in touch and they got married three years later. So that's that's a voyage to three or four five weeks. Haven't checked that properly. So it was fairly easy to trade off to the statute of age because I said cemetery records, Perth Metropolitan Cemeteries, there she is. And the fact that she was um, died in. December uh, 1991 means that she was almost certainly 87. This unlikely for us, she was born in 20. We know she, she wasn't born in late December because we knew her birthday was the 18th of June. Um, so, yeah, that's right. So she, um, we thought she was 87 and therefore born in 1904. Okay, so the first thing. I always like to do with these family histories, family stories, is to, even if you're pretty certain they're right, is to check the facts. And so there we've got her immigration through the um, UK Outgrowing Passengers List, which is an ancestry and file in my past. I found that checking, that the indexing of these is, it can be a little bit, I've got a lot of flaky, you can look at Look for somebody you know is there and you've seen it before and you can't see it again, that kind of thing. So, and of course, they also often have, in this case, they didn't make a miss, F or M, but sometimes they just have Miss E or Miss or Mr or whatever. And so, you need to be fairly careful checking the most and don't take no from the answer if you think they were going to destroy between 1890 and 1960. And sometimes the National Archives website also has people. Um, if they're actually immigrating. I have worked out what their criteria is for having them, having them in the guest or not. It's always a bit check to do. And there's all the on the same, same ship, so that story was confirmed. Okay. And they got married, as we were told, in the 19, married in 1930. So then the, the, I did say to my friend, look, you can order that certificate. And with any luck, it might have her parents' names. She might. You would hope she knew them, although she was almost certainly very small when they died. Um, I did actually try to make it easy to go around and Google car crashes in England in 1905-ish. And I thought, you know, how many were there? Yes, I thought it was a site that said it was 134 or something. I remember what they were doing. You know, like, what they were doing past. 
And for that since then, um, my friend has actually been looking at a lot of places in the area with the interest of our family, and he still hasn't come across a report. So we don't know about that. So anyway, then I started the what might be called donkey work. Mm -hmm. So I hope this doesn't just disillusion people as to anybody's working methods, not mine anyway. So, so I just started to make a list of all the ethical M or ethical May light heads, or even ethical light heads, who were born around that date. And then I started finding exactly what quarter they were registered in, and pretty well that did the June quarter, so that we took a little while to do this. Not forever, but you know, it's just a nice study, leg work. And so then, we had three possibilities that were the most likely possibilities. And in fact, the top one was actually an ethyl May. The other two, I think, were just ethyls. So I started to have a good feeling about that, which turned out to be true. And um, at that point, what I would have done is start looking at the 1991 census for each of those three, and then look for the parents in the 1901 Senate, those named parents, to see if they had died in the ensuing few years. However, I'm not sure about that because my friend came back to me and said, Oh, my grand says, my nan says, there was a brother called Vincent and a sister called Dolly. Now, don't you love it when people give you information that would have really helped you? <laughs> so, we didn't know that Dolly was. Dorothy, Doris, Doreen, whatever. However, that made life a lot easier because the Dover family, the family in Dover, looked at that with Dorothy and Vincent. Couldn't kiss it. So they were there and that gave the parents' names as Cecil and Louisa. And we'll cut a long story short because this is all fascinating. But, um, of course, the next thing was to look for Cecil and Louise's deaths. And sure enough, they didn't die together. And we don't know that car crash because we haven't sent for their um, death certificates. But they did die in 1906 and 1909. So the was very small when they died. Interestingly, and this I can't resist telling you this, that <laughs> Louisa had previously married Cecil's brother John, who died in 1896, and Dorothy was there at the time. Mm -hmm. And what was really more interesting is that the British Parliament didn't pass an act in 1921 saying that you could marry your, um, what's your, your husband's, your dead husband's brother. The deceased wife's sister act had been passed, but not the deceased brother's. So, so obviously, they didn't matter, they're all registered, it's all registered and everything. That didn't make the second marriage hard to find because, of course, it's registered as white head marrying white head. And by then, I knew that her surname, the original maiden name, is Harmer, so I put the back and the early one, etc. You know, I don't need all those details, but it was fascinating finding this family. Okay. So, so Dorothy was there, and, and, and then I could search the GRO indexes, the general registrars. Um, and that can now be searched by a maiden name. Now, until recently, the indexes on former past and so on, you could only search with the maiden name from, I think it was 1911 onwards. But now, GRO indexes, in which are searchable by anybody, and you, can, you have to register it, it's free to register. They have the mother's maiden name. Now, you can only search for over five year. Spans, so you search for a year and two years offside, and then you've got to do another five years, etc. So you can't do the whole of the 19th century, but you can, with this, it was possible to find the whole family. Okay? And there's the total list Morris and Dorothy in the first marriage, and then Vincent, Lilius, and our Ethel in the second marriage. So Ethel was only two. Ish, we don't know exactly when the mother died, and five when the father died. So that basic fact of them dying, which is very small, was also true. 
Now, I can't resist telling you what happened to them all. It's really got the same impact. Uh, Dorothy got that study about 1911, it's about um, 15. She's in St Stephen's home in Lewisham, on the outskirts of London, being trained in laundry or house. It sounds wildly exciting, doesn't it? They're trying to get a useful, a useful uh, trade. Vincent had gone to the National Children's Home in Edgeworth near Bolton in Lancashire, and you can easily Google that and find what we're excited about it. It was huge. It was a village. There were 345 children or something. They were in, it was meant to be a fairly enlightened sort of uh, orphanage. Um, they were in what were called group homes, but they were quite large numbers in the group homes. So they were at least not in huge, huge, huge dormitories. And that it was like a modern village, and they were being trained in farm work and trades and so on. And the majority of boys were boys and girls. So I haven't looked into it in detail, it's really interesting to see as, a, as an idea of an early effort to make it not so much like the workhouse and so on. And then Lewis was at St Margaret's Convent School in Orphanage in East Grinstead, and Ethel, which was so small, I presume. Maybe she was with her uncle James Milton Whitehead and his wife Laura in Newport in Yorkshire. Which, when we talked about that, um, my friend talked about this to his nan. And she said, Oh, yes, mum wouldn't talk about her childhood. It, she had it, it was really, really miserable. She was, yes, she was a girl, she said, it was really miserable. And this map gives you an idea about how separated they all were. Mm -hmm. So, so what happened to them? Well, Morris died in 1902. This Dory, Dorothy, Dory, she was, uh, I sort of feel like she may obviously made some attempt to keep, in touch, keep the family in some way um, linked. And she was the one who had sent cards. That's why um, my friend's grandmother said, Oh, we used to get Christmas cards from Auntie Dory. Mum used to get these cards. I found that she did not marry, she died in 1989 in Sunset. Um, and so did Vilius, same deal. I did find at least one of them in the 1939 register. Does everybody know about the 1939 register? In England? Yes, it's an interesting Okay. That's excellent because that depends on the birth and the trajectory of the sisters and so on. And Vincent, who everybody had lost contact with, I don't know his name, he immigrated to Australia. They knew that, they did know that. And I found a whole lot of stuff about him. He died in Victoria and he has his two families. And because one of the people in the back of the tree on ancestry is a private name, it's possible that one of the he or she is still alive and the cousin of his grandmother is still um, in Australia. And really, the um, the movie in of this story is that when my young friend went back into my mother and said, Have you anything found your mum's family and what happened? She was in tears. She said to something, you're not related, he's in tears, he's not my friend. She said, I've never known my friend. What was it before that? And I've now got, obviously, the grandparents, I'm just going to be happy, and I did want to be happy, which I don't know. And also, I've now got their parents, so I don't know if they've been quite finished all the ones. Slapping out as some roots that she had totally not known and had wished for all the long. So, in fact, it shows us that this you can affect the people for good or ill. Sometimes it's even quite out of the necessity on time. But in this case, she was really happy. The other interesting thing is, I did ask, is there a photo of their film? Because we'd like to take a photo. And she said, if I don't think I have a photo of either, I don't have a photo of either of my parents. Which I don't know why, and they just wanted to take a picture to photos. So for Ethel, we used sanitary records, we used Western Australian women, there's his marriages, has to do with ancestry, um, UK census records, um, birth, death, and marriage on ancestry, and the Australian electoral rolls was really uh, helpful when I was trying to establish a business um, whereabouts and it is, um, and his family. And finally, I passed the 
because there's no reason the UK census records are not compliant. It's really just a dog between my mom passes and the census. Just getting my mom passes is really good with the UK records. And it's much easier to find because you're not going to have 4,000 people when you get it because I'm in the wrong places as well. So, yeah, it's just fine. It's just often easier to get it. Sometimes you dread it. Something on five month passes it, but then when you actually know exactly what to search for, you can get more information on it. It's just really awesome. Um, the GRO already said that we did marriage services and the Victorian funds for the business family. So, this is time for questions. Yeah. Um, joining the dots. So, I would always say verify the family story as much as possible. My experience is that there is, I would say, always some grain of truth. Even if it's been diluted or, or Got a lot of baby over the decades, but there's usually something that is that is true. And you know, we all know the stories of people who have the Dukes or somebody, but it turns out that there's still somebody in the aristocracy, it might not have been a Duke, but it's somebody or that kind of thing. It's almost always something you can um, check. I was going to say, think laterally. Think if you can't find it one way, what's the other way you can maybe get at it? What's another angle? What's another record that might shed light? And so then you go backwards and forwards between resources. And so I did you did you realize the first three going in between the newspapers and the news and back to the disparities and then back again? I thought it was exactly. And then I've got tweak the searches, so this is more. I really, really hate the ancestry pad. I don't know if they've shown it so much lately. It says, I told you in the name. Don't you want to see it? Um, yeah. No, it was that easy, none of us So I typed in the name rubbish. The, you know, you often have to tweak the name, use a Boolean search, do an asterisk, do something to, and in fact, in the case of Ethel, Dorothy, her old sister Dory, Ethel's mother's maiden name is Palmer, and the GRO in Texas has got it as Warmer, which is not helpful at all. And so you really sometimes have to really make some guesses, change some things to get what you think you really want to. And that's what I call tweaking. And I love this summer, you can plug it here to the library. Pick the pioneering federation in Texas because it's so searchable like that. You can search everybody who was three as a tourist and not all the stuff that came after John and Amy's is very useful and wonderful for other things. So, yeah, tweak, always thinking, can I get around this? What's well, another way of looking at putting this information in? Thank you. I think we take questions. Anybody answer? I have a cup of coffee.